Qin Shi Huang and the Mercury Rivers In 246 BC, a 13-year-old boy became the ruler of Qin, a warring state in ancient China. His name was Ying Zheng, but the world would remember him as Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor to unify China under a single dynasty. He had conquered kingdoms. He had standardized writing, currency, and law. He had built the foundation of what would become the Great Wall, but none of it was enough. Because Qin Shi Huang feared the one thing he couldn't conquer, death. So he sent scholars, magicians, and explorers across the empire and beyond, some as far as the Pacific Ocean, searching for the Busi Jiao, the drug of deathlessness. He ordered his court alchemists to create an elixir that would grant him immortality. And they did. The elixir was made from cinnabar, a bright red mineral that produced liquid mercury. Ancient Chinese alchemists believed mercury was magical. It flowed like water but shimmered like metal. It was associated with power, transformation, and eternal life. The emperor drank it every day, for years. Meanwhile, he prepared for eternity in another way. He ordered the construction of a tomb, a subterranean palace that would take 39 years to complete and require 700,000 workers. Inside, the tomb contained a map of his empire, with rivers and seas filled with liquid mercury. Above, the ceiling was studded with pearls to represent the stars. And surrounding it all, an army of 8,000 life-size terracotta soldiers ready to guard him in the afterlife. The tomb even had traps, mechanically triggered crossbows designed to kill anyone who dared enter. But the emperor never made it to his palace. In 210 BC, at the age of 49, Qin Shi Huang died. Not in battle, not from old age. He died from mercury poisoning. The very substance he believed would grant him immortality had slowly destroyed him from the inside. Chronic mercury poisoning causes confusion, violent irritability, loss of control, and eventually, death. He built rivers of mercury to protect himself in the afterlife. But it was the mercury in his elixir that sent him there. Modern tests of the surrounding soil show mercury levels so high, they still exceed safe limits today. The poison he swallowed is still there, preserving his tomb, just as he believed it would preserve his life. Qin Shi Huang wanted to rule forever. Instead, he became the first of many to die chasing immortality. Alchemists and the Philosopher's Stone For 400 years across medieval Europe, Men dedicated their lives to a singular obsession, the Philosopher's Stone, a mythical substance that could turn lead into gold and grant eternal life. The alchemists worked in secret laboratories, mixing mercury and arsenic. They believed the process unfolded in stages marked by color, black, white, yellow, and finally red. The red stone was the ultimate goal, capable of transforming any metal into gold and producing the elixir of life. One of the most famous names is Nicolas Flamel. In 14th century Paris, Flamel was a manuscript seller who became wealthy through business. When he died in 1418, at around 80 years old, he was buried in a Paris church. But 200 years later, a book appeared claiming Flamel had discovered the secret. The legend said he found a mysterious manuscript, deciphered it with his wife Perenel, and successfully created the Philosopher's Stone. None of it was true. There is no evidence the real Nicolas Flamel ever practiced alchemy, but others weren't so fortunate. Paracelsus, a Swiss physician born in 1493, didn't just theorize, he experimented on himself. He believed mercury, sulfur, and salt were the building blocks of all matter. He pioneered chemical medicine and is now called the father of toxicology. But Paracelsus drank his own elixirs. He worked with mercury constantly. In 1541, at 48, Paracelsus died suddenly. The cause was never recorded, but the symptoms of mercury poisoning were unmistakable. Tremors, memory loss, blindness, and kidney failure. The alchemists knew the risks. Mercury caused madness, paralysis, and agonizing death. And yet, they continued. They heated cinnabar to extract liquid mercury. They mixed arsenic into elixirs. They inhaled toxic fumes. Some developed tremors so severe they couldn't hold their tools. Many died alone in their laboratories, poisoned by the substances they believed would save them. The phrase, mad as a hatter, comes from this era. Hat makers used mercury and slowly went insane. The alchemists were no different. Today, Nicolas Flamel's house still stands in Paris, the oldest stone house in the city, now a restaurant. But the philosopher's stone was never found. Parabiosis, young blood transfusions. In 1864, a French scientist named Paul Bert surgically joined two rats together, connecting their bloodstreams. The technique was largely forgotten until the 1950s when a Cornell gerontologist named Clive McKay connected old rats to young rats. The old rats lived longer, the experiment raised an unsettling question. Was there something in young blood that could reverse aging? 
In 2005, Stanford researchers revived the technique. They paired old mice with young mice, linking their circulatory systems. Within five weeks, the muscle and brain tissue of the old mice began to resemble that of the young mice. Something in young blood was sending signals to old cells, telling them to regenerate. By 2014, the results were undeniable. Young blood improved memory, rejuvenated the heart, and activated stem cells, and Silicon Valley was paying attention. In 2016, a Stanford graduate named Jesse Carmazan founded a company called Ambrosia. The pitch was simple, pay $8,000 and they'd fill your veins with plasma from teenagers. Carmazan claimed it was a clinical trial, but there was no control group, no peer review, and participants had to pay to join. Ambrosia opened clinics across California, Florida, and Texas. The treatment took two days and one and a half liters of plasma from donors aged 16 to 25. Clients paid via PayPal. Peter Thiel, the billionaire founder of PayPal, reportedly spent $40,000 per quarter on transfusions from 18-year-olds. It wasn't science. It was vampirism with a credit card. Legitimate researchers were horrified. Tony Weiss Carre, the Stanford neuroscientist whose work had inspired the experiments, condemned ambrosia of abusing people's trust. The risks were real. Plasma transfusions can cause lung injury, circulatory overload, and infections. Carmazan claimed the treatment reduced cancer markers and improved sleep, but he never published the data. In February 2019, the FDA issued a warning calling young blood transfusions potentially harmful with no proven clinical benefits. Ambrosia shut down, but Carmazan didn't stop. He opened a new company called Ivy Plasma, offering the same transfusions for $12,000. Today, legitimate researchers continue their work through real clinical trials with Alzheimer's patients. They don't charge participants, they follow protocols, they publish results, but the damage was done. The dream of eternal youth had been reduced to a Silicon Valley grift. The science was real. The application was a scam. Cryonics, the frozen bodies. Right now, in Scottsdale, Arizona, there are over 200 bodies stored in giant metal tanks filled with liquid nitrogen, frozen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. They've been dead for years, some for decades, but their families believe they're coming back. In 1962, a Michigan professor named Robert Edinger published The Prospect of Immortality, arguing that if you freeze a body immediately after death, future medicine might revive it. Five years later, James Bedford became the first. The 73-year-old professor died of kidney cancer. Within two hours, his body was injected with antifreeze and packed in dry ice. The preservation was primitive, but Bedford's frozen body became proof of concept, and it's still frozen today at Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Arizona. Since then, around 600 people worldwide have been cryopreserved, with thousands more on waiting lists. Full body preservation at Alcor costs $220,000, usually paid through life insurance. The most famous cryonics myth? Walt Disney. For decades, rumors claimed Disney was frozen beneath Disneyland, but it was completely false. He was cremated in 1966. His daughter said he'd probably never even heard of cryonics, but one famous name really is frozen. Ted Williams, the Hall of Fame baseball legend. When Williams died in 2002, his family split. His daughter wanted him cremated, but his son produced a note saying they agreed to be preserved at Alcor to be together in the future. Williams' body was sent to Arizona. Then a former Alcor executive went public with allegations. He claimed Williams' head had been accidentally cracked, drilled with holes, and stored in a lobster pot. Alcor denied everything, but the damage was done. Today, both Ted Williams and his son are stored at Alcor just their heads. The science, however, remains deeply flawed. No one has ever been revived, and yet, the waiting list grows. Robert Edinger, the man who started it all, died in 2011. His body was cryopreserved at the institute he founded. The frozen bodies remain in their tanks, suspended in liquid nitrogen, maintained by weekly refills, and the hope that someone, someday, will figure out how to undo death. Until then, they wait in the cold. Mind Uploading Digital Immortality in 2018, a startup called Nectome pitched an idea to Silicon Valley investors. Pay $10,000 and they'd preserve your brain so perfectly that one day, scientists could scan it and upload your consciousness into a computer. You'd live forever, digitally. There was just one problem. The process was 100% fatal. To preserve a brain well enough for uploading, Nectome needed it fresh. That meant connecting a patient to a heart-lung machine while they were still alive and pumping embalming chemicals through their arteries until the brain turned into glass. The company's co-founder was upfront. The user experience will be identical to physician-assisted suicide. 
25 people signed up anyway, including Sam Altman, CEO of Y Combinator. He told reporters he was pretty sure mines will be digitized in his lifetime. Nectome won an $80,000 prize for preserving a pig's brain and secured nearly a million dollars in federal funding. But there was a fundamental problem. Nectome had no idea how to actually upload a brain. They were selling death with a promise they couldn't keep. Neuroscientists were horrified, and yet the dream persists. Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, is working on brain-computer interfaces with the long-term goal of creating a backup of human consciousness. Musk has said he believes it's possible to download memories and personality and store them like files. In Russia, billionaire Dmitry Itzkov founded the 2045 initiative with a roadmap for digital immortality. By 2025, transplant a human brain into a robot. By 2035, upload a personality into an artificial brain. By 2045, create holographic bodies. None of it has happened. The technology doesn't exist. But the philosophical problem runs deeper. If you upload your mind to a computer, is it still you? Or is it just a copy? If the upload wakes up in a digital world and you're gone, who won? No one knows, because no one knows what consciousness is. And until we do, mind uploading remains what it's always been, an expensive way to die for the promise of becoming something else. The question isn't whether we can cheat death. It's whether, in trying, we've forgotten what it means to be alive. If you made it this far, thank you. Make sure to subscribe for more stories like this, and let me know in the comments which moment in history you'd like to see next.